Hey, oceanography class, let's go over chapter five, water and seawater. So the main takeaways from this chapter that water has a lot of very unique properties, thermal and dissolving properties. Um, seawater is mostly water molecules with a lot of dissolved solids in them. That's why it kind of has that salty taste to it. And ocean water salinity, temperature, and density vary in the water column, vary with depth. So those variables are not the same on the surface as they are uh, deep underwater. The presence of water on Earth makes life possible as we know it on Earth. You may know that it, it, water is really essential for sustaining all forms of life on our planet. And in fact, it's the primary component of all living organisms. About 65% of human makeup is water, and plants are about 90%. So water is extremely important to all organisms on the planet. The chemical structure of water, H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen, gives it really unusual properties and makes it uh, very unique and also um, has specific properties that actually help organisms on this planet survive. So if we go down to the atomic structure, um, just a little review, but atoms are uh, building blocks of matter. They're made up of subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons are found in the nucleus and they're positively charged and they have mass. Neutrons uh, have no charge, uh, but they also have mass, and they're also found in the nucleus. So this would be a depiction of an atom, and this would be the nucleus here. Uh, surrounding the nucleus are electrons, and they have negligible mass and a negative charge. So they're kind of orbiting the nucleus uh, in various electron shells surrounding the nucleus. So the number of protons in uh, any atom distinguishes that chemical element. So for example, uh, carbon has six protons. And any atom that has six protons must be carbon. If you increase, if you add one proton to that, um, then you have a whole new element, and that would be nitrogen. Nitrogen has seven protons. A molecule, on the other hand, a molecule is where you have two or more atoms that are held together or bonded together by uh, shared electrons. And that's the smallest form of a substance. So when we look at the water molecule, so H2O, we have uh, a larger oxygen atom here in the center. And it has about six electrons in its outer shell, right? In order to achieve stability, um, according to the valence rule, you have to add two electrons to it. And so what oxygen commonly does is bond with hydrogen. Hydrogen is just one proton and one electron. So hydrogen willingly shares its electron with oxygen and another hydrogen atom over here. And that's where you get the formula H2O. Okay. Oxygen is a very uh, electronegative atom, meaning that um, because it's so close to having eight uh, electrons in its outer shell, um, it kind of hogs the electrons and, and pulls them really closely. So what ends up happening is that the hydrogen atoms uh, start to kind of move towards the bottom end uh, of uh, the oxygen molecule because of the high electronegativity from uh, oxygen itself. Um, <clears throat> and so it, it creates this kind of unique structure where uh, the, both hydrogen atoms are about 105 degrees to one another. Okay, normally what you would see with most molecules is here would be a hydrogen, here would be the oxygen, and then here would be the hydrogen. And it would be kind of like a straight line with this bond. Okay, but uh, so what, what happens as a result of this bend um, is that uh, it gives water very unique properties. One is that it's dipolar. And that, that means that one side of the molecule has kind of like an overall negative charge. 
uh, and one side has an overall positive charge. And that's shown in kind of this these diagrams here written out. Okay. And so that polarity means that, like I said, there's positive and negative charges on either side of the molecule. And so what this does is this attracts other water molecules and they end up bonding together in the form of hydrogen bonds. So there's an attraction in between molecules, individual molecules of water. And so the negative end of a water molecule is uh, forms a hydrogen bond with the positive end of a different of a different water molecule and same over here and then so they start forming these links together and that's how kind of water molecules bond to one another through these hydrogen bonds hydrogen bonds um, are weaker than the covalent bonds between the hydrogen and oxygen so this bond right here where they share the electrons between hydrogen and oxygen is called the covalent bond those are really strong bonds and they're very hard to break and, and you would have to put a lot of heat and energy into water to break those bonds um, hydrogen bonds are much weaker uh, it takes less energy to uh, kind of disrupt the links between each water molecule so the the reason why we mention hydrogen bonding is because that accounts for or contributes to some of the properties of water one is cohesion molecules sticking together if you ever spill water like on a surface maybe a kitchen countertop you'll notice that a lot of times water kind of like bubbles together and links up together um, also water has high surface tension uh, meaning that like one example is that like you say you pour a glass of water um, you can pour fill up the glass completely and a meniscus will form it's kind of like a uh, concave shape uh, above the rim of the cup so like water can be piled into the cup above the actual rim and that's because of that surface tension and cohesion with uh, water molecules kind of sticking together um, also waters you know you might not think of it but it is kind of sticky after you get out of a shower um, you have water water doesn't just repel off of your body right it is kind of uh, like sticks to your skin and that's why you have to towel off okay um, another uh, interesting property of water is that it it has high solubility of chemical compounds meaning that um, if you put uh, solids into water it can dissolve some solids and so and it can keep a lot of dissolved solids uh, in suspension uh, in the water um, it also has water also has very unusual thermal properties which are very important in terms of um, how heat is distributed in earth and how it affects our climate and then also water has an unusual density or change in density when it goes through phase changes okay so water is a solvent let's take uh, salt for example that is NaCl so you have a sodium ion here and a chlorine ion ion they're bonded together by electrostatic attraction or ionic bonds and so if you have like a glass of fresh water and you start putting salt in it and you start uh, mixing the water and salt the water molecules themselves the positive ends will start ripping the chlorine um, atoms from the structure okay so they'll they'll remove the negative chlorine from the salt and then the other ends of the water molecules will pull the positive cation from the structure and essentially that's what dissolving is it's just it rips those ionic bonds apart and then those ions kind of remain uh, with the water in suspension all right what water also has very unique thermal properties on the Earth's surface, you can find water as a solid, liquid, and gas, a gas especially in the atmosphere. And that influences the heat that travels uh, throughout the Earth. And the reason is because water has uh, a unique property of distributing heat as it goes through phase changes. Um, so if you look at 
solid water where the molecules have formed a crystal structure. You can see that here. All the individual molecules have kind of bonded together into a solid. When uh, a solid ice melts into a liquid, so this is uh, a liquid over here where the molecules have the ability to move freely, they'll still form those hydrogen bonds uh, as a liquid. And when uh, a liquid turns to gas, we call that either evaporation or boiling, what happens, those three processes, melting, vaporization, uh, or evaporation, and uh, or sublimation, which is going from a solid all the way to a gas, which is less common, um, that absorbs heat and cools the uh, environment around them. So uh, it absorbs heat from the environment. So it takes heat from the environment every time it goes through uh, one of these phase changes. If you go in the other direction from uh, gas, uh, so this is independent molecules, water molecules in the air, uh, and that condenses to form a liquid, or you have uh, a liquid condensing even further and freezing to form a solid. Freezing, condensation, and deposition, um, that all leads to a release of heat into the environment. So heat is actually being released into the environment. So you can see as, as water moves through, let's say, in ocean currents or water vapor in atmospheric currents uh, uh, into different regions of the Earth, it will transfer heat. It will absorb heat from areas, carry it around, and then release it. So it kind of moves heat uh, depending on which direction uh, or phase change is occurring. Van der, Van der Waals forces are a kind of um, these forces that hold individual molecules together. They're relatively weak interactions. Um, and it exists between electrically neutral molecules because of kind of an uneven distribution of charge. Okay, so in order to kind of uh, uh, have water go through phase changes like gas to liquid to freezing or the other way around, energy must be added to those molecules to overcome those van der Waals forces as well as the hydrogen bonding between each molecule. So let's take a step back to, to, to understand the phase changes of water and how heat is distributed uh, throughout uh, those changes by understanding heat and temperature. Heat um, is a transfer of both kinetic and potential energy from one object to another due to temperature differences. Okay, so um, think of something that's really hot, maybe a stove top, and you put something cold on top of it, heat is going to transfer from the hot stove top to the pot or skillet or whatever it is. Um, and Heat is something that you can kind of uh, you can measure um, in an object, something that it can contain. Okay, um, temperature that is the a measurement of the average kinetic energy of molecules in a substance. So it's kind of like a moment in time when you're finding out how um, how uh, kinetic or how much kinetic energy is in an object. Right, how hot it is. The hotter an object is, and we measure that in Fahrenheit and centigrade, um, but if something has really high temperature, that means it has really high kinetic energy and it's really hot. Okay, but that's temporary, right? It can cool down or it can heat up in, in some cases. Um, so that's kind of like a, a measurement of a moment in time. Okay, so like to understand the difference between heat and temperature. Let's take, like say you fill a bathtub up with really hot water and you're gonna take a bath. Um, and then you also have a candle. Okay, this got really romantic, but you have a candle um, and you've got a flame on that candle. Now, um, if you measure the temperature of the flame in that candle and the temperature of the bathtub water, the temperature of the candle flame will be much higher, meaning that the average kinetic energy of the molecules that are involved in that combustion is higher than the, than the temperature or the average kinetic energy of the water in the tub. But um, you can, the water in the bathtub holds more heat 
energy. Like it, because there's more water and it's a bigger volume, there's more heat being stored in the bathtub than there's heat in that kind of flame. So even though the flame is hotter, has higher temperature, there's more heat in the bathtub. Okay, and then a calorie is the amount of heat that's needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So say you wanted to increase the temperature of your your bath your bath water, you'd have to add heat to it, and then you'd have to have calories and calories of heat uh, to increase its temperature. So basically, adding heat to the water. So if you add enough heat energy to any solid, it will melt into a liquid, and if you continue to add heat to a liquid, it will evaporate or um, uh, vaporize into a gas. Okay, this is true of all substances, right? Water has unusual freezing and boiling points. The freezing and boiling points of water are high compared to uh, similar chemical substances. Okay, um, the freezing point uh, or melting point, depending on the direction you're going in, is uh, zero degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, the boiling point is about 100 degrees centigrade. Okay. Um, those those are unusually high. And if you look at water, this is compound. Remember, it has that bent uh, dipolar type property. Um, a similar compound without that uh, would have a melting point of negative 90 degrees centigrade. Okay. Um, and have a boiling point of negative 68 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so that that uh, is unusual. There's a big difference uh, between uh, water. It takes a lot of heat um, that you must add to water in order to make it boil. Other substances, you don't have to a lot add a lot of heat for it to um, boil away or you know evaporate away. And that's important because what that means is water can hold a lot of heat. I'm sure you've had this experience where you're like, all right, I want to boil uh, some pasta for, let's say, mac and cheese, or you're making a, you know, some sort of pasta meal, um, and then you get all this water, you put it on the stovetop, and you're waiting for it to boil. It takes forever. <laughs> Sometimes that happens, especially if you're trying to bring water to boil that's at room temperature. Um, it can take a long time, and the reason is is because water has high heat capacity. Okay, heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of a substance one gram by one degree centigrade. Okay, so water has high heat capacity, which means it can take in a lot of heat or lose much heat without a drastic change in temperature, and that's critical. Okay, so think about that. Here's pure water with high heat capacity. Okay, um, things that we don't want to have high keep heat capacity, iron and copper, for example. I wouldn't say we don't want it, but they just don't have high heat capacity. And so because of that, we use them as pots and pans. Why? Because they don't have very high heat capacity, meaning that as, as soon as you apply some heat to those substances, the heat moves through them and heats it up really quickly. So it will cook your food really fast because the heat's going to transfer through the copper and into your food, right? So that's why we use them as pots and pans because they have such low heat capacity. Um, another uh, example of this would be like, say you go to the beach, right? A lot of times, especially in the summertime, if the sun is out, the sun will be hitting the sand and the sand gets really, really hot. So you have to kind of like quickly shuffle, shuffle your way to the water where it's much cooler. Well, yeah, if you look at quartz sand, which makes up a lot of beach sand, it has a much lower heat capacity, meaning that the surface of the sand is going to get really hot and potentially burn the bottoms of your feet, right? Whereas the water temperature in the ocean, fortunately, um, in these hot Florida summers, um, it won't heat up that surface water so drastically. So ocean water kind of remains... Uh, uh, mild, let's say. It doesn't heat up s so quickly and doesn't cool down so fast, and that's because of um, the heat capacity of water. And we also refer to this as specific heat.
And then there is latent heat. Um, water has high latent heats. What latent heat essentially me means is uh, hidden uh, heat, so to speak. Okay, so water has the ability to absorb um, a lot of heat uh, when heat is being added to it. Okay, um, and when there's a major change of state, meaning like going from uh, a solid to liquid or to a vapor, um, there's a lot of heat that's released during uh, that change of state. Okay. Um, and that is related to its high heat capacity, right? And it makes sense because um, what will happen is if you add heat to water, the temperature won't change that quickly, right? It takes a lot of heat to change that temperature. And specifically when you're going through a phase change, like say you're going from ice to uh, liquid water, um, as you add more and more heat, the temperature of that mix will not change. So if we, if we look at this diagram here, um, you can see at the bottom we have calories and heat, okay? Um, and then here we have temperature. All right, and then A, B, C, and D are different kind of junction points uh, where there's a, a phase change or a drastic change in either the temperature uh, or a phase change in the, in the water. Okay, so if we start over here with ice, right, we're at really low temperatures. And if we start adding heat to that ice, um, the ice is going to absorb that heat and its temperature is going to start to rise, okay, until it hits point A. Okay, point A is when the ice starts melting at zero degrees centigrade. All right, and so what's interesting is it's going through, water's going through that phase change, going from ice to liquid water. And when that's occurring, you're adding more and more heat, right? So if you're moving along this direction, right, you're adding more and more calories to that ice and water mix, but the temperature remains at zero degrees centigrade. And that's what latent heat means. Because that's you know what perplexed a lot of people doing these measurements is when you're when you're melting ice and you're taking its temperature, the solid ice block at zero degrees centigrade is the same temperature as a mix of ice and water together, zero degrees centigrade. And the temperature of that mix will only go up until all the ice has completely melted. And that's point B right here. Okay, so as ice ice melts, it reaches that plateau, and all the energy that's added is used to break up the kind of intermolecular bonds in ice, and it does not increase the temperature. So that's called the latent heat of melting. All right, and that's approximately 80 calories per gram. Okay, if we if we continue um, from spot B, and now we're at liquid water just above zero degrees uh, centigrade, and we continue to add heat, so we're moving in this direction, continuing to add heat, what you notice is the temperature starts to rise. So if you have a liquid and you continually increase uh, or add heat to it, the temperature will rise until it hits the next plateau at C. And that next plateau is the water begins to boil, okay? Um, and you're going from liquid water to water vapor, okay? And when when that occurs, then you start have you start have to kind of not only break the van der Waals bonds but also the hydrogen bonds, okay? And that's referred to the latent heat of vaporization. All right, that's the amount of heat that must be added to a substance at its boiling point to break the intermolecular bonds and change uh, the water from liquid to vapor. And it's approximately 540 calories per grams. And every single hydrogen bond in between every water molecule must be broken. Okay, so that's here. So say you have wa boiling water, right? You can continue to add more and more heat, right? More and more calories as you travel in this direction, but the temperature of that boiling water will remain 100 degrees Celsius. It'll do that until, and this is assuming that 
you have a closed system. So all the water vapor is being trapped. Uh, let's say you have like a, a, a top to that boiling water and all the gas molecules are being trapped. Okay. So until you've boiled all the liquid water away and then all that water is in its gas phase and water vapor, only does the temperature increases once you get to point D right here. And that's when here you see that temperature starts going above 100 degrees Celsius. And that's because all the water is gone. And we call that the, um, the latent heat of vaporization, the hidden heat of vaporization, because um, this is the heat that's being added without seeing a drastic temperature change as you're going from liquid to water vapor. Latent heat of evaporation essentially is um, the conversion of a liquid to gas below the boiling point uh, of water. So ocean temperatures rarely hit 100 degrees centigrade, but evaporation still does occur in the oceans. And so what happens here with evaporation, say in the oceans, is an individual water molecule will, uh, in, in order to break free from the surrounding ocean water and enter into the atmosphere as a gas, uh, it must capture the heat energy from its surrounding neighboring water molecules. So the molecules left behind will have given up heat so that that one molecule can evaporate. And that explains kind of uh, the kind of cooling effect of evaporation, right? Like whenever you work out and you start sweating, right? Uh, you have beads of sweat surrounding on your skin, and then that evaporates away. And when it evaporates away, it absorbs heat from your body and into the atmosphere, and that's why you cool down. That's why we sweat when, whenever we do exercise. It's the body's response to our increased uh, temperature, and it wants to regulate and cool ourselves down. And that latent heat of evaporation is about 585 calories per gram. Okay. Then there's the latent heat of condensation. So we're going in a different direction here. Um, cooled water vapor turns to liquid and then releases heat into the envir environment. So this is the same as the latent heat of vaporization, just going in a different direction, going from a gas to a liquid. And then finally, latent heat of freezing. So heat is released when water freezes. So when you have you go from a liquid water to a solid as it freezes and becomes a solid, heat is actually released. And that is equivalent to the latent heat of melting. So here we go. These are the different hydrogen bonds in all three states of matter for water. This is the solid three-dimensional crystalline structure, bonds between each one of the water molecules. When you go from a solid to a liquid, uh, there are some hydrogen bonds, not, not every molecule. Some are free, completely free moving. Some are bonded together. Uh, and then when you go to a gaseous state in, in, in terms of water, all molecules are free to move wherever they want independently. So what does this have, what does this have an effect on the uh, thermostatic effects on Earth? Well, um, it helps moderate the Earth's surface temperatures. When you're at the equator, the ocean water doesn't just boil off and boil away. And when you're at the poles of our Earth, the oceans don't freeze solid. Okay, So heat energy is exchanged uh, as water kind of moves through these different states, as it evaporates or condenses. It helps kind of uh, transfer heat uh, to different environments. And that's what really makes life possible on Earth. For example, in like really cold areas, let's say the air temperature drops down below zero degrees centigrade, that would freeze water, right? But water is unique in the fact that uh, ice floats, so when it turns into a solid, it's less dense than the surrounding liquid. So a skin, so if you look at a lake, right, and it's below freezing, the outer um, or the top layer of the lake will freeze solid like a skin. Uh, kind of above the water, and that helps insulate uh, the temperature below uh, that kind of outer frozen layer, and that keeps the fish underneath warmer, essentially, 
because they're insulated with that layer of ice on top. Um, so water has very uh, unique effects. Um, and so when we look at our globe, um, we have latitudes where there's a lot of evaporation. We call those evaporation latitudes. Okay, uh, this is where um, evaporation exceeds precipitation, and uh, a lot of heat is removed uh, uh, from the oceans here and travels through uh, air circulation and brings a lot of heat to polar latitudes, right? So that helps distribute heat to colder regions. And essentially, it cools down these latitudes, which are really hot. These latitudes are really hot, and then helps transfer heat to cooler regions. And so that's why these lower latitudes don't boil away, and then these higher latitudes don't freeze completely, because heat is being transferred uh, from warmer areas to cooler areas. And so that leads to uh, really cool effects, like the marine effect. So if you're surrounded by an ocean, um, that helps moderate the temperature from day to night, meaning that there's less of a, of a range in temperatures. It kind of moderates it, makes it milder. Okay. The continental effect, because land has such low specific heat, um, they have a, it has a greater range of temperatures from day to night in different seasons. So what that essentially means is, like say this is, if you're in the middle of the continent here, in uh, the United States, say the Midwest, um, it's much hotter during the day than at nighttime. So the days get really hot, and then at night it cools down dramatically. But if you're in Florida like we are, or if you are out in the ocean, um, those uh, differences in, in daily ranges in temperature are minimized. And the reason is because water can absorb a lot of heat. And so it doesn't affect the air temperature above the water. Let's compare two cities. Okay, we've got um, Norfolk, Virginia, on the east coast, and we have San Francisco here. Okay, so the prevailing uh, winds are in this direction. Okay, so what happens is um, San Francisco typically gets air masses that have been sitting over the ocean and move in through San Francisco. In Norfolk, Virginia, um, again, they're at the same latitude, so they'd be receiving the same amount of sunlight and during throughout the year. On the x-axis here, you see all the months of the year, January to December, and on the y-axis, temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit, okay? So because San Francisco receives a lot of the um, uh, air masses from over the ocean, its temperature is milder, meaning that during the winter months, January and February, it's actually warmer than Virginia. And during the summer months, April to September, it's cooler, right? Um, in Virginia, during the winter months, it's really cold, right? And then the summer, it's really hot. So that range is really large. Whereas the range from summer to winter in San Francisco is much smaller. So it helps moderate the temperature. So Norfolk, Virginia has hotter summers and colder winters as compared to San Francisco. All right, well, another kind of really unique property of water is its, is its density and how it changes when it goes through phase, phase changes. Um, density is uh, mass per unit volume. And so the density of water increases as temperature decreases. So if you start um, uh, like cooling water down, its density will increase. And that's called thermal contraction. Happens with most substances. We call it shrinkage. Um, it kind of tightens uh, the molecules together when you cool it down. Okay, But something unusual happens with water. Okay, So when you're going from liquid water to ice, okay, forming that crystalline substance, something very unique happens. So if you look at this, down here at the x-axis, that's temperature. So if we're going in this direction, we're decreasing the temperature, right? And predictably, the red curve here is water. So as you decrease temperature, this is uh, the y-axis is density. 
So as you uh, increase, uh, decrease um, temperature, density increases. It starts increasing, um, but then all of a sudden it kind of plateaus. Do you see that? And the colder and colder it gets, density kind of plateaus this, to these areas C and D. Um, and then there's a big decrease or a jump um, in density as you go from uh, liquid water to ice. And so down here, this here, E, would be ice. That's the density of ice, right? So the density of uh, ice is less than that of water. And that's why ice floats. It seems totally normal, right? Like, because you drink ice water all the time, you get a glass of water, you put ice in it, the ice floats to the top. That is weird. That is very strange in terms of substances uh, um, on Earth. M typically, um, this green line is what n normal substances, as you continue to, to decrease temperature, density will continually increase even when it turns into a solid. Like say you have, let's just say you have liquid iron, let's say, and you have liquid iron, but then you have, uh, it's cooling down and then there's solid iron within that liquid iron. The solid iron will sink amongst all the other liquid iron and sink to the bottom of the cauldron or whatever you know, uh, uh, you know, he heating it up in. Okay, so that's, so that's strange. Ice floats, very strange. Okay. Another unusual property of water is that um, it actually expands by about 9% when it freezes. So w what happens is uh, the way it forms that crystalline uh, three-dimensional structure, it actually it forces the molecules to expand outwards. Okay. Um, and so uh, it changes the molecular pattern, packing, and then it expands water as it freezes. So I'm sure this has happened to you. Maybe you had, uh, maybe you were like, oh, I want a cold water, and you put it in the freezer, but then you forget about it, and then you go back in. The water expanded, and it busted the, the bottle that it's in. Okay. Um, if you increase pressure on water or add dissolved substances, meaning like thing, like solids, like salt, if you add salt to it, um, that decreases the maximum uh, or it increases its density if you add more dissolved solids in it. Okay, um, dissolved solids also can uh, reduce the uh, freezing point of water, right? And that's why uh, in cold places people salt the sidewalks because that lowers the uh, freezing temperature of water itself, and you won't get uh, water or ice forming on sidewalks or on roads. And so on Earth, most seawater never really freezes because of the dissolved solids that are found in it. And those dissolved solids that are in ocean water, we refer to as salinity. That's the total amount of dissolved solids. Okay. Um, the ratio of the mass of dissolved substances uh, to the mass of a water sa sample is the salinity. And we typically express it in terms of parts per thousand, or PPT. So uh, the average ocean salinity is about 35 parts per thousand. And it's easy to remember because uh, parts per thousand, if you have a kilogram of seawater, which is a thousand grams, okay, whoa, okay, <laughs> a thousand grams of seawater, uh, that means 35 parts per thousand will be uh, dissolved solids. So that means that there's approximately 35 grams of dissolved solids in seawater. Okay, so if you had a thousand, a kilogram of seawater, let it evaporate away, you, you'll have left behind approximately 35 grams of substance. Okay, if we break that down into what those components are, um, here are the, the, the ions. Uh, chloride makes the majority of it, um, and then there's sodium. Those typically bond together, make sodium chloride, that's salt, so it's mostly salt. But then there's sulfate, there's uh, magnesium, a big portion, calcium, potassium, and then a, a slew of other elements that make up the rest. Here's an example comparing um, uh, the, the salinity in seawater. Here are the different constituents, okay? Some of the minor constituents in seawater, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, dissolved gases, nutrients, 
uh, and then the trace constituents, okay, stuff that's in really small amounts. Okay. So how do we determine salinity? One way is evaporation, as I mentioned before. That's a very early technique. Um, you just get some seawater, let it evaporate, evaporate away, and then uh, you know find out and like you can you can measure the weight of the water, then it evaporates away, and then measure what's left behind. That's a way of doing it. Um, but it's not too accurate because some salts evaporate with the water, so then you're actually um, underestimated underestimating the salinity of the water itself. So later on, uh, other things were developed like a salinometer. This measures the water's electrical conductivity. So the more dissolved substances you have uh, in the water, the faster or more efficient uh, electrons move through the water. Okay. So for example, say you attach a battery uh, and you put electrodes in water. Um, if, there, if fresh water is not electrically conductive, so this bulb wouldn't light up. But if you have seawater, there are a lot of dissolved solids in it that helps transmit those uh, electrons through it and makes it more or increases the conductivity. So the saltier the, uh, the water itself, the more conductive it is. So that's how a salinometer works. Um, and then there's the principle of constant proportions. Um, and this is uh, analyzing the proportions of materials in ocean water via titration. I'm sure maybe you've seen that in a chemistry class. Um, so the major dissolved constituents in ocean water remains in the same proportion regardless of total salinity. Like, for example, I think uh, sodium was about 25% of uh, of uh, the dissolved substances in seawater. So you can go to a different area on Earth where you find real, or ocean on Earth where you find really salty seawater, but the proportion of that being sodium would still be 25% versus other areas where you have input a lot of fresh water uh, from rivers. The proportions of those dissolved solids remains the same. Okay. So here is uh, just an example of um, the comparison between pure water and seawater. Okay, uh, if you notice, the freezing point is lower in seawater, so it has to get much colder, as well as the, the boiling point is just a little bit higher. And if you also notice, the density of seawater is larger than that of pure water, and that's because of all the dissolved solids that are in them. So in the in our open oceans. Uh, the salinity is, varies between 33 and 38 parts per thousand. Um, uh, that's in the open ocean. Uh, in coastal areas, meaning like closer to the continental shelves, all right, shallower water, coastal areas, the salinity can vary w more widely, meaning that uh, if you've enclosed areas where the evaporation rates are high, you'll have higher salinity. Or if you have a lot of rivers dumping out fresh water into the coastal areas, that will lower salinity. And those mixes of fresh and salt water we call brackish water. Okay, that typically lowers salinity. There are special areas that have um, really high salinity. Uh, we refer to them as hypersaline. And what that means is usually it's like an enclosed area um, where evaporation rates are really high, like the Great. Uh, Salt Lake has um, the water there has a salinity of 280 parts per thousand, and the Dead Sea, which is found here uh, between Jordan and Israel, this area here, very dry, really high evaporation rates. The um, salinity there is 330 parts per thousand. So that's almost that's about 10 times saltier than the regular ocean, and so. What that means is, <laughs> if you ever go here, it's so salty, the ocean water is so dense that our density doesn't really change that much. So you can float in the Dead Sea without even swimming. And that's because the water is so dense relative to you, you become like a boogie board and you can just you just float to the top very easily because the water is so salty. So uh, this woman is, uh, you know, really coolly reading a newspaper without worrying about sinking in the water because uh, the water is so dense. Okay, so what are the processes that affect salinity? Um, 
when you have decreasing salinity, typically that means adding fresh water to the ocean. Rain or precipitation uh, will lower sea surface salinity. Runoff from rivers, if you have icebergs that are melting uh, or sea ice melting into the ocean, uh, that will all lower salinity. The things that increase salinity, essentially what that means is if you're removing water from the ocean, remember, uh, so you have the ocean, evaporation is basically taking water molecules and moving them into the gas phase, um, transferring heat, uh, that uh, will increase salinity, all right? So that evaporation is an example of that. Um, in cold areas where sea ice forms at the surface, uh, ice itself does not include any of the dissolved solids in it, in its structure. So when ice forms, it's like removing water from the ocean. So the remaining water that's left behind becomes saltier as a result. So here are those processes here, and this is how uh, they affect seawater water salinity. You can review this um, uh, later in more detail. All right, here are... Uh, this is a comparison of uh, river water to seawater. Okay, here are the different uh, constituents in the water or dissolved solids. Okay, um, pure water would, would be closer to having not too many dissolved solids, but look at seawater has 34,000 parts per million, or around on average 34 parts per trillion of the dissolved solids in them, and it's mostly chloride and sodium. That's why it tastes nasty when you taste seawater. I know accidentally maybe a wave hits you in the mouth and you just gag tasting seawater. Yeah, river water on the other hand, uh, much less um, dissolved solids in it. Uh, not even one part per thousand. It's only 0.1 parts per thousand. Okay, so let's understand uh, how water moves through all the different environments on Earth. We call that the hydrological cycle. Uh, this also affects seawater salinity. It helps recycle water from the ocean to atmosphere to continents to groundwater. Um, and water is in continual motion because it can move through all three phases and be transported with atmospheric winds. It can get everywhere. And essentially, water is just hopping from different uh, reservoirs. Okay, so uh, in the ocean, every year, approximately 320,000 cubic kilometers evaporates into the atmosphere and that evaporated water travels into the atmosphere condenses and then falls down on rain as rain or precipitation as snow um, most of that 284 cubic kilometers just falls right back into the ocean okay um, <clears throat> the, uh, about 96,000 cubic kilometers will precipitate on land as rain or snowfall uh, and then that water will run off and return into the ocean or evaporate back into the atmosphere. So that's, uh, oh, and some of that water infiltrates down into the groundwater. Um, so that's the fate of water as it kind of travels through uh, our entire environment. Our water, uh, most of it is found in the ocean, about 97.2%. Uh, uh, the, the rest is found in glaciers and ice caps. And then uh, all the water that's in the atmosphere, streams and lakes, Lake Toho, Lake Titicaca, all the groundwater, that's less than 1%, less than 1% of global water, okay? So most of the water is found in the oceans and in glaciers. Residence time is the average length of time for a substance to kind of remain dissolved in seawater. Um, ions that have high residence time in the ocean typically are higher in concentration. Uh, dissolved ions that are in the ocean with short residence times typically mean that they're in lower concentration. And what that means is that they get pulled out for some, some process pulls them out uh, of the ocean itself. But the ocean's in the steady state condition, and that's the average amount of various elements uh, kind of remains constant in our oceans. And this is how different materials cycle through our oceans, okay? Um, here, ions that enter the ocean through these processes, we have rivers discharging. Rivers go into the ocean and discharge a lot of dissolved solids, okay, into the, into the ocean. And that's typically weathered material, rocks from land. Uh, volcanoes can erupt 
and this material delivers sulfate and chloride uh, into the ocean. Okay, and then finally, hydrothermal activity provides a lot of calcium and potassium. So these are volcanic areas at the bottom of the ocean, mid-ocean ridges. There's a lot of circulate, circulating ocean water here, and a lot of ions are delivered to the ocean uh, through these three processes. And then uh, ions are removed from the ocean uh, by absorption or precipitation, so things directly precipitating out of the water. Um, here's some absorption. Some uh, magnesium and sulfate uh, are kind of almost like deposited and interacting with the rock in these hot volcanic areas. Sea spray, biological activities, so carbonate, calcium, sulfate, and sodium um, uh, are part of this process. And then also the hydrothermal activity at the bottom of the ocean. The ocean's acidity uh, and alkalinity, or that balance we refer to as pH, uh, is very important. An acid uh, is uh, a solution that release, releases a hydrogen ion, H+, when it's dissolved in water. And an alkaline, or base, releases the hydroxide ion in water. Okay, and then pH scale is what we use to measure that. Uh, any pH value that's less than 7 is considered an acid, so lower numbers are acid or more acidic. And pH values uh, that, great, that greater than 7 are basic or alkaline. Uh, pure water is neutral at 7. So here are some common substances on that scale. Here's pure water that's neutral. Uh, milk, rainwater, coffee, beer, that's more uh, on lower on the scale, so it's more acidic. Tomatoes and grapes are kind of acidic, and then you go down to the worst is battery acid over here. That's really acidic. And if you go in the other direction, more alkaline materials, uh, baking soda, milk of magnesia, household ammonia, drain cleaners, those are uh, more basic. So the pH in the ocean varies from the surface. Uh, as compared to deeper ocean water. So if we look at this scale here, zero to about 4,000 meters, this is ocean depth. So this is the surface, and then this is approximately four kilometers beneath the surface. And then up here is the pH scale. So surface ocean water uh, has a pH of about 8.1, okay? So it's more alkaline than pure water. Um, but as you go uh, to deeper and deeper levels within the ocean, the, it becomes more and more acidic. Okay, And the reason is this really low pH layer here, right before you hit one kilometer of depth, is ca caused by uh, marine and animal respiration. And then as you gradually get deeper and deeper, uh, this uh, it becomes just a, a slightly bit uh, more uh, basic as you go deeper and deeper. But still, deeper waters tend to be uh, more acidic uh, than surface waters. Um, then there's uh, the carbonate buffering system. And buffering essentially keeps the ocean from having wild swings in alkalinity or acidity. Okay, And what that essentially means, it kind of keeps it uh, balanced and uh, keeps the kind of chemical reactions from going too far uh, in one direction, OK? Uh, so what happens is um, the precipitation or dilution of calcium carbonate, which is this here, really uh, keeps in check or stabilizes ocean pH. So what happens is it's produced or dissolved, depending on what the oceans is doing. If the oceans are absorbing a lot of CO2 uh, from the atmosphere, there won't be big changes in the pH. Let me, let me show you the diagram. This might make more sense. Okay, So as atmospheric carbon dioxide enters uh, and is absorbed by the ocean and it becomes dissolved CO2, you add that to water and you make carbonic acid. So if seawater becomes too alkaline, the chemical reactions start to release the hydrogen into the seawater, and that will lower the pH. 
Now, on the other hand, if seawater becomes too acidic, the chemical reactions will run in the opposite direction. Okay, so then here, the bicarbonate ions will combine with the hydrogen uh, free ion and then create carbonic acid and pH then rises. So these two um, equations are, or chemical reactions are occurring simultaneously and it kind of balances the, uh, the ocean's acidity. Okay. Um, and the, the, uh, the calcium carbonate um, that's in the ocean uh, in large part is created by calcium secreting organisms. So these are the, uh, this is the material that precipitates and dissolves and kind of runs uh, these reactions and buffers the whole system. So surface salinity, surface meaning if you're on the surface of the ocean, that varies or open ocean surface salinities varies depending on where you're located. If you're at high latitudes, uh, you typically have low salinity and the reason is because there's abundant sea ice melting, precipitation and runoff going into the oceans. At lower latitudes, you also have lower salinity and that's because there's a lot of rain uh, and a lot of runoff. At mid latitudes, these are the high salinity latitudes and that's because there's a lot of warm and dry descending air coming from really high altitudes in the atmosphere and that increases evaporation, which leaves the remaining ocean water very salty. Okay, so if we look at a globe uh, and we check out the, here's the te here's temperature, right? So from pole to pole, it's, it's very cold. And then as you approach the equator, it becomes very warm on average. Um, so you go from low salinity, high latitudes to low salinity to high latitudes to the equator. You typically have low salinity. And then these are the, at the Tropic of Cancer, and at the Tropic of Capricorn, you have high salinity, and that's because evaporation rates are really high. So here's a satellite-derived ocean salinity map uh, of the globe, and it confirms what we just saw, is that at the Tropic of Cancer, these latitudes, and Capricorn, uh, we have uh, higher salinity than, than here at the equator and at the kind of uh, closer to the poles, right? This is ocean surface salinity. So whatever you see in orange and red has higher salinity. Lower salinity would be in these kind of purples and blues. So how does ocean salinity vary with depth? Here, it doesn't really break down mid latitudes. We're gonna do that in another uh, lecture, but at low latitudes, typically salinity decreases with depth, okay? So here is the uh, low latitude, um, uh, the salinity curve for low latitudes. So uh, that shows uh, increased salinity at the surface and it decreases with depth. So uh, this is the surface. Here is salinity on the x axis. Here's depth. So you're going down uh, deeper. Um, <clears throat> what happens is Salinity is kind of constant, and then you see here a drastic decrease in salinity. At high latitudes, uh, you start off with low salinity. I'm sorry, this should say mid latitudes. Mid latitudes. Uh, at high latitudes, you start off with low salinity, and then as you get to right around like 300 meters, then salinity increases drastically. And then once you go beyond one kilometer, uh, at, at both mid and high latitudes, uh, the salinity kind of levels off and kind of uh, they almost kind of close in together the deeper and deeper you go. Um, and so what this creates is right here, there's this layer called the uh, halo climb. And that separates different ocean layers based on salinity and density. So freshwater or, you know, pure water, uh, water has a density of one gram per cubic centimeter. Ocean surface water is denser and it, because salinity varies and temperature varies, then the density varies as well. So uh, that varies from 1.022 to 1.030 grams per cubic centimeter. And so what that means is that the ocean itself is layered uh, based on the density of water masses. 
so if we look at a cross section of our ocean, okay, here's Antarctica, all right, here, and Greenland in the North Pole, and then here's the equator, okay, so we're looking at pole to pole, cross section, here's depth, so surface down to really deep. What it creates is a three layered structure. We have this upper layer of very low density, almost like uh, warmer mixed layer we have here. Then below that would be the, the halocline or the pycnocline. We'll go into what the pycnocline is, but this is the second layer. Um, now this is not to scale. The pycnocline really isn't that thick. And then the last layer, uh, which makes up the majority of ocean water, is called the, the deep layer. Okay. So density increases with decreasing temperature. And that really has the greatest influence on density. Okay, so if you have, remember, density equals mass over unit volume. Okay, so if your temperature is going down, right, remember temperature causes shrinkage. So that would mean that the volume would decrease, right, which would make this whole value go up. So density would increase if temperature decreases. Now, if, say, you had density over mass over volume, say you had, instead, temperature increase. Temperature increase would mean that the volume is going to expand. So the volume expands, which makes this number or this fraction smaller, and therefore the density would decrease. All right, so that's how temperature affects density. Decreasing temperature, increased density. Increase in temperature, that would actually decrease density. Okay, um, if you have salinity, density increases with increasing salinity. Okay, that's the example of the, the Dead Sea. If you have more salt in the water, uh, that means it's denser. And density also increases with pressure. What that means is the deeper and deeper you go uh, beneath the surface of the of the ocean, uh, the higher and higher pressure there is, and then the, the water becomes more dense as a result. Okay, so let's take a look. Here's a, a more accurate depiction of those ocean layers uh, from density. There's a surface zone here. Low density water at the surface makes up about 2% of the ocean. Then here's what we refer to as the halocline or pycnocline, makes up about 18% of the ocean. Okay, that's where you see a drastic increase or decrease in salinity or a drastic increase in or decrease in temperature. Then here's the deep zone. This makes up the majority of ocean water. Okay, so the pycnocline is an abrupt change of density with depth. And that's basically the result of it is because of temperature. Drastic changes in temperature in the ocean water leads to changes in density. Okay, so here, um, if we look at uh, cross section of ocean water from the surface to about four kilometers of depth. Here's the surface zone, and uh, we'll look at temperature, right? So here's temperature is fairly constant for the first 100 meters, let's say, but then all of a sudden there's a drastic decrease in temperature, and temperature drops very rapidly. Okay, so here's temperature, higher temperatures are over here, lower temperatures are in this direction. So what happens is if you were, like say you were swimming in this water and you could somehow go deeper and deeper uh, uh, into the ocean water, it would get colder and colder. It would remain constant for the first, let's say, 100 meters. Uh, then once you go beyond that, then there's a drastic decrease in temperature. And then once you get down to the deep zone, it kind of levels off, okay? And so that corresponds to changes in density. So higher densities over here lower densities over here. So increasing density goes in this direction, okay? So what happens is you have very low density water at the surface, and that's because temperature is pretty high. But then the density drastically increases right here at the thermocline or pycnocline. And the reason why the density increases is because the temperature is dropping. So temperature drops means density goes up. And so that makes a whole new mass of water, right, uh, that sits on top of the deep zone. And then as you go into deeper and deeper water, uh, the density kind of levels off because the temperature also levels off, okay? And that's the same, it also holds true with the halocline. Halocline uh, is this area here, 
and that's where you have changes in salinity uh, with ocean depth. And so essentially what this does is this segregates uh, ocean water into different masses of water. Low density ocean water will sit on top of the higher density ocean water. All right, here is temperature and density variations with depth based on two different latitudes. So over here are at low latitudes, and this is at high latitudes. So at low latitudes, um, you know, in the Caribbean or, you know, on the coast of Colombia or Ecuador or something like that, you have really hot waters at the surface, surface mixed layers, really warm waters. But then once you go into deeper, deeper waters, it starts to temperature decreases rapidly, okay? And then here is the thermocline. This is this ocean layer here that goes down to a depth of about one kilometer. The pycnocline is, is the, the, the kind of opposite, right? So the surface mixed layer is very low density, but then density increases sharply in that same layer up until about one kilometer, and then density kind of levels off and temperature levels off. And it, you know, these temperatures is about like two degrees centigrade. So if you're in a submarine down two or three kilometers, it's two degrees centigrade. That's very pretty cold. Okay. At high latitudes, so if you were up in like the Bering Sea, uh, if you were in um, off the coast of Norway or something, there aren't these ocean layers. It's all the deep ocean, one one layer. There's no change in temperature or in density. These are called um, uh, isothermal water column, meaning like if you're on a boat and you fall off into the water here, it's two degrees, two to three degrees centigrade. And that temperature doesn't change whether you're four kilometers underneath the, in the ocean at a depth of four kilometers or you're on the surface. So the temperature is the same on the surface as it is four kilometers deep. And we call, there's, that means there's no thermocline at these high latitudes. And also there wouldn't be any peak nocline or change in density. The density of the ocean water at the surface versus four kilometers of depth is the same. Okay, so this is our layered ocean. We have a mixed surface layer that's above the thermocline. We have the upper water, which is the pycnocline or thermocline, and then there's that deep water. So at high latitudes, this deep water, you see that? It's on the surface of the Earth at the high latitudes in the North Pole and in the South Pole. That's why it's so dangerous to go, you know, the, the deadliest catch. I don't know if you ever watched that show, but uh, those fishermen, if they fall into the water, they'll get hypothermia pretty quick. So water is very cold. So at high latitudes, those ocean layers, thermocline and pycnocline, really rarely develop. And so we refer to them as isothermal or uh, isothermal, where there's no density variation. Okay, now let's talk about how, how, is it, how is it possible to remove salt from ocean water? We call that desalinization. Um, our needs for fresh water is always increasing because um, uh, we use it for all kinds of purposes. Um, but a lot of times it's very energy intensive and expensive. And so desalination plants uh, really, uh, they only provide 0.5% of human water needs because they, it costs a lot of uh, electricity to, to kind of desalinize ocean water. Uh, the most common method, and this is a cool survival tool if you ever stranded out in like somewhere uh, away from civilization, but it's called distillation, okay? This is the most common pra uh, practice. Uh, when, you, when water is boiled uh, or if uh, ocean water evaporates, it can condense and that condensed water is pure water and you can use that and you can drink it. Um, solar distillation can be used in really arid climates and so what you do is you have ocean water um, in a container that gets heated up by the sun that water starts to evaporate and then you drape some plastic over it and have it tilted towards a beaker and a funnel. And all that evaporated water will be caught by this plastic sheet and under the force of gravity will condense and then move down in this direction and then drip into your beaker. Very slow process, but um, this can be done kind of like in a makeshift way if you're ever stranded and it can help you survive actually. So. Then there's uh, a, 
electrolysis. This is where um, a membrane is between fresh and saltwater tanks, and you help help pass it through. Um, uh, here's an example. You pump seawater through. Here, there's some pretreatment. Here's the desalinization running through uh, those uh, filters, removes about 99% of the, the salt itself, and then here's the storage and delivery of that water. Um, so that's a more complicated process uh, and, it, and is very cost intensive. Then there's freeze separation, uh, but that's probably more efficient in, in uh, cooler areas. Uh, but when you freeze water, and thaw it, like say you freeze it, uh, only fresh water will be frozen, and then you can thaw it later and actually drink that water. 